Hello, everybody, and welcome to Find My Pass from Home. It's Wednesday, March 22nd, and I am super, super excited about today's topic. Um, I hope you are all ready for a fascinating and enlightening discussion. And I am so pleased to introduce my friend and colleague, Blaine Bettinger. I think for the first time to Find My Pass from Home, Blaine welcomes and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Jen. It's a pleasure to be here. I think Blaine does not really need any introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Uh, genetic genealogist, um, known around the world, uh, absolute specialist and expertise in using DNA and DNA evidence in our family history, but also just one heck of a good guy. Um, and um, a creator of several different Facebook groups that have kind of exploded and helped each other reach out and helped us collaborate across this new and exciting world that we're in today, right, with DNA and other types of family history evidence. So with that being said, today we're going to talk about one of the newest innovations, I think, um, but also something that we've all been using for a long time, whether we've recognized it or not. And that, of course, is artificial intelligence or AI. But today we're going to specifically talk about chat GPT, I think is where we're going to spend most of our time today. We already have a lot of you tuning in and saying hello. So thank you very much. Um, Terry is with us. We're in Glasgow. Daphne. Hi, Daphne. It's good to see you. Um, Paul is in cloudy Warrington. Um, it is snowing here. So as you all know, I'm in Colorado and I actually was not expecting this today. It's just a light flurry. So right around zero Celsius, but should get up to about eight or so. What's the weather like in New York today, Blaine? Uh, believe it or not, in central New York, the sun is shining. It's um, it's 45 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, it's it's going to be a not so bad day. So I'm right. I'm, I'm very happy. I need it. I'm I'm done. With it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty done too. Yeah, um, I was hoping it would be different today. I I prepped Blaine before we started that every one of our sessions starts with a weather report, so he knew and and hopefully was expecting that. Um, but we've got lots of people chiming in. So Jackie's in Cambridge, and um, we've got Hazel in Albuquerque, and that's so great. Um, Christine is in Manchester. Daniel's in Newport Beach, California. Um, and we've got people from New York and San Diego and Edinburgh and Norway. Oh, that's very cool. Hello, Jillian and Nancy and Valerie and John, all sorts of you. Fantastic. Um, thank you all very much for being with us. If this is your first time with us at Find My Pass From Home, please be active in the comments. Uh, we like to know what you're thinking, what you're talking about. Um, we like to know what you're working on. So share your discoveries, like our Facebook page, like our community over at the Find My Past Forum. Um, we like to share and we like to talk uh, family history all the time. So we also have Charlotte in the comments. So everybody say hello to Charlotte, who will be helping answering questions today and sharing links for us. Um, and I think with that, we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot to talk about today. So the first thing, of course, that we want to do right off the bat is talk about what chat GPT is and what it is not. I think that's probably one of the best places to start. So in the comments, if you've used chat GPT at all so far and played around with it, let us know and tell us your experiences. But Blaine, can you kick us off a little bit with what chat GPT really is and how it can be useful? Sure. So, and I think you raised the, the most important takeaway point of the day already, right off the bat, is understanding what chat GPT is and what it isn't. And frankly, what it isn't is probably the most important thing that, that we can learn. So, um, you know, chat GPT is, is what's called a, a large language model, which means it has been fed massive, massive amounts of text-based data. And what ha has done with this uh, text-based uh, data is it has essentially um, been trained to predict the next word in a string of words. So given a prompt, this algorithm, which has been trained with, with just gigabytes of data, will say, you know, in all the gigabytes of data that I was trained with, what was typically the next word in the string that, that um, might be provided in response to this prompt. And so it will predict that word. And then it'll say, well, what was usually the next word? And so it'll create this whole string of words that is a, a prediction of, of what, what the text it was fed 
would produce. And so um, it, it it's providing what it thinks would be uh, an answer that maybe you or I might produce based on the, the text that it's provided. Now, um, unfortunately, you and I were not the only people that provided, um, you know, text to this machine, and which means that there's going to be a lot of issues with the predictions that it generates, right? It takes, it's trying to provide the best, most average prediction, right? But as we all know, average sometimes isn't necessarily the, the best thing. And so it, it does the best job it can based on things like the the input that it's received and the um, the prompt that we give it in turn. So it, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, it, it's limited in that way because it's a lot of people will look at this tool and think, well, it's, you know, we give it a prompt or we ask it a question and then it goes out and finds an answer, right? It's scrolling through these databases and and trying to give us a, a, a solution to that question. And, and it's not going out and searching any databases for factual information. No matter what prompt it, we give it, it's still um, predicting um, the next word in a string of, of in, a, in a response, regardless of, of what we want it to ask, okay? Now, what's interesting is when I, when I say the most probable, I don't mean the most factually correct, right? It may be that the most probable string it produces in response to a, a prompt um, is not the most factually correct response. And also it may not be the most grammatically correct, right? It doesn't necessarily care about grammar. It's sort of the the average is is usually grammatically correct, but it's not going to be grammatically correct every time. Okay, so that's kind of a, a limitation as well. Now, the most, the the best summary of ChatGPT that I think I've ever found are these three words, and that is ChatGPT is good for words, not facts, right? This is not Google. It is not meant to produce facts in response to a query or a prompt. It's meant to produce words, a string of words that is the most likely string of words that we would produce in response to that prompt, right? And so because it's words, not facts, then using this as a, a fact um, generation uh, system is, is gonna lead to erroneous results. It, it will, unfortunately, it will make up a response because it, it's trained to produce a response. So if, for example, we ask it, you know, X, Y, Z, um, and expect a factual answer, it's going to provide you an answer that doesn't mean it's a, a factually correct response. And that's the problem. Okay, so we have to understand that that's probably the, the biggest limitation of the tool. It doesn't care if the output is factually correct, right? And and if we understand what the tool is, we know it shouldn't care what the whether the output is factually correct. Now, we can talk about what chat gpt is today what will be uh, you know what these ai thing algorithms will be five years from now and i think the goal will be moving towards not only producing this great content but also um you know increasing the factual accuracy kind of bringing those things together and we're already seeing some search engines like bing and google incorporating ai like chat gpt um, into its responses so that it can, you know, enhance that factual um, response that we may be getting or may not be getting. So um, now, again, like I said, it's not going out and pulling facts from database one and database two or, or anything like that. So it's not, you know, it's not trained to go out and, and do that. It's not Google, for example. Okay. Now that being said, right, understanding these limitations, what what can I use this tool for? Well, what I've been using it for, for example, and I'll look at this in just a moment, is getting some historical context for my ancestors' lives. I don't use Chat GPT or similar um, algorithms to ask specific questions like, 
this is my ancestor, John Doe, tell me more about him, or where was my ancestor, John Doe, born, and things like that, right? I, it, that's factual information that I don't expect ChatGPT to be able to produce. But if I know John Doe lived in Vermont in the 1850s, right, it's important to understand the sort of uh, – social and historical context of Vermont in the 1850s to better understand my ancestor's life. So I can ask ChatGPT, for example, to provide some um, some historical context for that um, that time frame, that that um, person's life. And of course, I'm not going to take what it gives me and and all of a sudden start you know writing a, a narrative with that information because I need to confirm it, right? I need to go out and do my own research. So this is a starting point. Um, now, also, ChatGPT is very good for translation, for example. Um, it's very good for working with OCR text. And in fact, there was just a really great blog post published about that. I think either yesterday or uh, the day before. Um, and I also think it's very good for brainstorming, right? So, for example, if I have, um, I know I want to give a talk, uh, I can go and give it, ask it to give me uh, talking points for that talk, for example. Um, I may reject some of them. I may accept some of them. I may, um, you know, love all of them. I may hate all of them, but it gives me a way to sort of brainstorm these questions, right? Let's say, for example, I'm going to give a talk about genealogy and chat GPT just randomly, right? And so I can go and I can simply say to, to the algorithm, um, what are some talking points I can use or I should use when talking about genealogy or uh, the use of chat GPT for genealogy? right? And then it will output some talking points. I can do all kinds of things from there. I can say, give me 10 talking points, give me five. And then it may give me one. And I think, oh, wow, that's a really interesting point. Can you expand on X, Y, Z? So you can work with the results you've given to go another step forward, another step forward. It's sort of a, almost a mind mapping kind of, of way to go about this, right? Now, for example, um, one thing I think is is not such a good use, like I said before, is, you know, if I have this ancestor, Victor Mullen, my great grandfather, I, you know, I, ChatGPT doesn't have any information about Victor Mullen. And I knew that going in that even if it told me something, it probably wasn't going to be accurate. And so this isn't what I want to use. On the other hand, if I do something like this, right, he was born in this time frame or he lived in this time frame, he lived in this place. What are some historical events that happened in that place and time that might have impacted his life, right? Now, these are pretty big ones. World War I, sure, probably had an impact, right? The Spanish flu, all kinds of things. But then I, there, um, I didn't show them all, but here's one that's really interesting. Construction of the Thousand Islands Bridge. That's a bridge in um, upstate New York that connects Canada and um upstate New York. I never would have thought about that as as being a, a you know something that might have impacted his life, but there's certainly, you know, it, it opened up that com, um, uh, commerce with Canada, for example, even faster than than going across the river there. So who knows that might have had an impact, but that's not something I would have normally thought of on my own as, as having an impact on his life. So to think this is a good way, again, it's brainstorming. I'm not gonna I, I don't have any direct evidence that the Thousand Islands Bridge construction impacted his life, but I can now go and research it and say, you know, what impact might this have had on on people's lives in in this time frame, right? So, um, I think it's it's just a, an interesting tool that way. Um, here's another one, for example. Uh, my husband is is from Manila, for example, and so I can ask the question: How do I begin researching genealogy in Manila from the 1900 to 2000 time frame? Right. And so typically one way I would start would be to go to, you know, a website and start looking up resources that are available for that region of the Philippines, for example. 
Now, I asked this question in ChatGPT, and it started to give me some, some pretty interesting information, right? So, for example, start with what you know. Well, that's a really good starting place for a genealogical project, right? You always start with what you know and work backwards from there. Interview living people and so on. Um, looking for Philippine civil registration records and so on. Those are some really great um, ways to just get me started on a project, right? Um, well, church records, immigration and naturalization records, and so on. So I thought, you know, this was a really great way to, to get me started on this, this research. Now, that being said, oh, this is a little hard to read, but then I said, are there any books about genealogical research in Manila, for example? And then it started to list some books. Now, I can't find any of these books, so <laughs> I, I suspect they aren't actually, um, uh, they're potentially not real books. And that again, is part of the problem of ChatGPT is that it wants to provide a, a response. And so um, the thing is, is as it was creating this list, I was like, oh, I, I would love to get that book, number two. Oh my gosh, that looks like a great book, number three. That's fantastic. I want that book, right? So I was ready to, to shell out a ton of money ordering all of these books when I find that I can't find any of them. And so that's that's part of the limitation, I think, of, of, of chat GPT is that you start to get more and more specific. And um, that could be a, a problem when you ask for that kind of factual specificity, where on the other hand, you know, getting this very high level is a great way to sort of brainstorm, especially for a region that is just completely new to me, right? I don't even know where to start. So this might give me some clues um, about that. There are a ton of concerns, right? So, um, you know, we all know the phrase garbage in, garbage out, right? So what is fed in to train this algorithm will affect the output that we get. And so it's gathered for training uh, text from the um, internet. And so as we can imagine, there can be a little bit of bias on the internet, right? On, in lots of different ways. And so that bias might be reflected in the answers that we get. Another limitation is that ChatGPT was trained uh, at in a previous time point. So it's not being continually um, updated. Uh, at least not the the older version. And what that means is that, you know, there's a sort of a, a time limit on on the queries that we ask. So I think the most common um, query I, I saw is that it, it won't be very good with current events, right? Not current events that are about, you know, within the past two years or so, because it, it's just not going to have that training data. As far as it knows, nothing has happened in the world in the last two years, okay? And so it's not going to be able to answer anything intelligently. Um, you know, you can't say, for example, tell me the historical context of this event, right? Because it's, it's just, it may make up an answer, but it's not going to really know because it doesn't have any of that context within the past two years. Um, another thing I've seen is, for example, copyright issues, right? So I'm seeing more and more people doing things like writing books using um, these AI algorithms, right? So you'll give it a prompt and you'll say, write a chapter about XYZ. Now, ChatGPT usually has a limit on how much text it will produce in response to a query, but there are other tools that may not have that limitation, or you can build it piece by piece, all kinds of different things. And the question becomes, who wrote that story, right? If I give it the prompt and it will produce some text, then the question is, you know, did I, you know, did I produce this? Did the AI produce this? And at least in the United States, um, non-humans can't obtain copyright, right? It's been tested here. There was a famous case where a, a monkey took a photograph with a camera. And the question was, um, who owned the, the copyright in that, that photograph? Well, it wasn't the monkey. Okay, so an elephants, for example, have you ever seen the elephants that paint with their trunks and stuff? They don't have the copyright in that uh, in that image. And so if AI is creating that copyright, both text, um, we haven't even touched on um, AI image generators, which is a whole big, enormous field all by itself. Who owns the copyright in those images? And so 
um, you know, copyright offices are going to have to struggle with that. And in fact, the, the U.S. Copyright Office has really been pushing a lot in the past uh, couple of weeks about this issue. And in fact, if you file a copyright registra registration in the United States right now, you have to disclose whether or not uh, there was any AI use in the generation of that, um, that text or that um, work. And I, for me, that's, I really struggle with that. Now, I haven't looked in detail as much as I would like to about that, but what does, um, how do they define AI, for example, right? I mean, how broad could that be? One of the things I always argue is, you know, we've been using AI um, for so long, especially in genealogy. You wouldn't believe how much AI there is in genealogy. But even when I write a when I write a blog post, if I'm using Word, right, there is AI involved in a way in, in the form of autocorrect, right, or even predictive text, right? Word will start now predicting what I'm going to say next and, and auto produce it. And sometimes maybe it's better than what you were going to really produce, right? And so you're like, oh, I like that word choice word. Thank you. Now, if I submit that for copyright, is that considered AI content? And, and I don't really know the answer to that. This is really, really complicated stuff. And what if I do create um, a blog post? Now, there we I think the field of genealogy has some really high um, ethical standards, right? And so one of the ethical standards is always a concern about plagiarism, right? We document the source of our work, right? And if we use work from other people, we want to document and cite that work. Um, now, in my experience, plagiarism has really and always contemplated that the other creator was human, right? So when we copy work, you know, inadvertently or intentionally committing plagiarism, then that's somebody else, some human, um, you know, did that work. But now if I go and use uh, chat GPT to help me write a blog post and I don't disclose that chat GPT helped me create that blog post, I mean, to what extent might that be considered plagiarism? Now, probably that's not the greatest example, but what if I'm submitting a, a work to somewhere where, you know, I have an ethical obligation to disclose you know, that anything that isn't my work or to cite to something that isn't my work, that the question becomes, you know, do we cite AI generated content? If so, how do we cite it? There's all kinds of, of concerns that, that come up in that. So these are things that I think we will struggle with because I will tell you that this isn't going to be less prevalent as time goes on, right? This is going to be integrated more and more and more. You know, one thing I, I didn't even cover here because it's sort of, I guess, outside the realm of, of genealogy. But, you know, one of the things I use ChatGPT the most for is to write emails, right? I have, um, you know, let's say I want to write an email to someone about this topic or whatever, or maybe I'm even responding to an email. You know, ChatGPT will help me draft up an email. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the whole concept of, it's always better to edit a first draft than to, you know, come up with a magnus opus right away, right? You have to have something to work with. Having a chat GPT generated email is so much easier to work with for me than, you know, coming up with this completely uh, de novo. So I love having that, that email drafted for me. And then, you know, it's seldom perfect, but it's a whole lot easier to edit things than, than to, to create it um, out of the blue. And so, you know, that's that's something that I use it for the most. So again, the takeaway, number one, number one takeaway, I think, from this whole thing is it's chat GPT is for words. It is not meant to be for for facts. So, yeah, I mean, I think the, the potential here is enormous. I, there's so much that we can do. And what I kind of love about this is that it's um, every day it seems like someone comes up with a new way to to use these tools for um, for period, but also for especially for genealogy. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Blaine, for that overview. Um, and there's been lots of comments and questions, and I, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. But, you know, when Blaine and I were talking about setting up this discussion and how we were going to frame today's talk, um, one of the things that I did is I asked ChatGPT for a metaphor 
uh, to how to explain this tool to genealogists. Um, and the response I got back actually was actually pretty good. Um, and we, we both agreed it was a nice analogy. So think of it as a powerful flashlight. I am reading now straight from the screen, a powerful flashlight that can help you illuminate and explore the vast complex maze of genealogical data. It can help shine a light on that material, but it can't walk you through the maze for you. It can't find those answers. It can't analyze on your behalf, but it can help expose the opportunity um, like a flashlight in a dark maze. Um, so it, it is, I think actually, and Christine just, just put this comment on, is it saving you time and making your work, work more efficiently? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Um, and I would agree with Blaine's comment, like starting a new project. I just, last week I started working on a line on my mom's side that I've not really touched before. And um, they originate in Virginia um, as, as so far, right? Uh, eventually go back to Germany, I think. But I don't know much about Virginia. I haven't researched in that state a whole lot yet. Um, so I started that project by saying, hey, chat GPT, tell me about genealogy in Virginia. Where do I go? How do I start? Where where do I find vital records? Where do I find land records? What about the period before the Revolutionary War when it's still a British colony? How do I discern between those different time periods and historical events that are occurring? And um, for those of you familiar with US research, they're using meets and bounds land um, records instead of um, what, what what most states in the West use in terms of township and range meets and bounds is relatively new to me. I don't do a lot of that. Um, so, hey, chat GPT, give me a refresher on how meets and bounds work and how I plot this property out and, and actually understand the document that I'm looking at. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of advantage to this tool. Um, but as Blaine said, of course, take it all with a, a bit of, of, of caution and remember what the intended use is. It's not Google. I made that mistake very early on when I started thinking this was like a big fancy Google, but it's not. Um, it's not at all. So um, anyway, yeah, and that's it, again, for me, it's really the any way you can use it that it's um, generating text that you can use. I think that's really has been the best uses for me. So for example, you know, generating the, those emails. Um, uh, there was a, a great interview with um, Maureen Taylor, the, the photo detective, um, the, just a, a couple of days ago. And um, the, uh, the, the individual that Maureen was interviewing, I forget the name, was talking about how they, they used it to generate a, a, a talk proposal. And so, you know, that's a, another great way to use it. You're generating text um, to, to, for a, a talk proposal and, and it, you know, you generate the text and then you work with the text yourself to, to, to kind of polish the, the talk proposal or a presentation yeah. proposal or an email or a blog post or, you know, any sort of kind of text-based thing is really where you're going to get the most benefit out of this. I, and I'm seeing more and more people use it to generate narratives for example, about their families, right? Maybe you can feed it a bunch of facts and say, generate a narrative from these facts about my my ancestor. And the nice thing about it is, is you're in control, right? And so you're able to take that output and then massage it or refine it or, or you know, cut it out or do whatever you want to do to make it the final product. So Daphne commented during when you were talking through your slides, it's why would I need chat GPT in my life? Daphne, I hope we've answered this for you a little bit, but um, I would encourage anybody who hasn't looked at it yet, just go in, create an account, it's free to use, play around with it and use some of the prompts that can be found online um, in Facebook groups or even during today's discussion. You know, you can copy some of Blaine's prompts and just say, you know, how do I play with this? Tell me about life in, London between 1750 and 1800 and see what it will generate for you. Um, I think that's probably the best way to understand how it will be to your advantage is just to, to dive in it and work on it and see what happens. Um, okay, going through think, a couple of the, oh, go ahead, Blaine. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, I, my, unfortunately, I've seen a lot of people um, kind of not liking chat gpt because they've again made the 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 fact mistake right what they mm -hmm. they expect the output of chat gpt to be factual information which is which is not how it should be used so you know it's it's kind of like disliking um a a 
dog because it's it's not a cat, right? So I mean, it's <laughs> you know, it's 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 not the fault of the dog that it's not a cat, right? We have to understand that a, a, the dog is a dog, and you have to like or you know not like the dog on that fact. So you 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 have to evaluate chat GPT, not on the basis of facts, but how you might utilize this for text-based uh, generation. Yeah. And Anya makes a good point too, actually in the comments that she says, it feels a bit like discussion on using Wikipedia while at university as a source, um, which I think is very true and accurate. Uh, a tool that might be useful, but something to use with caution, just like hints in our, in the Find My Past tree, right? We've been using hints in the genealogy community for a very long time. We've been using shared trees and user-generated context. Um, think about all of the records that we use in genealogy that are actually generated by humans walking around cemeteries um, and society-driven projects. There are going to be errors in that data. Um, so it is something that we, we need to use intelligently um, and not make the mistake of kind of facts versus context. That's right. And, you know, one of my favorite um, genealogical articles that has ever been written was written by Tom Jones, and it's called um, The Perils of Source Snobbery. And in that mm -hmm. article, he talked about how, you know, there's an understanding that some sources are, are, are notoriously problematic. But as genealogists that look for anything that can shed light on our genealogical question, it's our duty to check even the sources that may have problems with an understanding of of what that those problems are and, and how we can resolve that. And I feel like, you know, um, uh, dismissing chat GPT as a potential um, resource is very similar to that source snobbery, right? It's it's tool snobbery in a way. And I think as as genealogists, first of all, you know, maybe maybe this is a little early to 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 be overly concerned or, you know, chase this down. But it's good that people are becoming aware of it because this will just, you know, this is just going to explode and become more and more of a tool that that genealogists, I think in the future, I, I think it's going to be hard for a genealogist not to use an mm -hmm. algorithm like chat GPT, um, just because of how useful um, and incredibly powerful it is, right? I mean, in, 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 in 2005, you know, there was probably very little need to purchase a Y DNA test um, or a DNA test in, in general, right? And, but now in 2023, it's really hard to be a genealogist um, and not use genetic evidence if, if it's available. And so again, I think chat GPT, not, not so much, who knows, maybe it'll be chat GPT, maybe it'll be tool X, Y, Z, who knows, but it'll be something that we're using these types of tools in. And I think um, one of my favorite parts about it actually is that it feeds from your conversation with it. Um, and I kind of jokingly said to Blaine a couple of weeks ago, like I find myself being very polite in the way that I talk to chat GPT, right? And I don't know why it's not, but I just do. I'm using proper grammar the whole time and I'm like correcting my spelling and things. But but um, when you ask it a question, it it can start with some very basic and broad information, but the more you engage in that conversation that you're having with the tool, the more precise and the more unique the information comes out. So you could go on and on and really dig into some topics and some brainstorming uh, opportunities that like as Blaine used uh, the example in his slides that you may not have ever thought of before. So I went on a, a pursuit, one of my first tests admittedly, on the system was to ask it about the 1921 census of England and Wales because I was thinking I'm gonna I know a lot about that census I can probably find the errors but because it's so new Chat GT, GPT doesn't actually know anything about the census yet the information it's working off of is two years old and obviously the census has been published since then um, but the information that so my next test was about something much more. Um, uh, proven in history. So I was actually asking it about migration patterns from England to the United States. And it started to work through some ideas that I hadn't thought of before, right? Meteorological patterns and um, and digging deep into the economic situation in the interwar period in England versus in the United States um, and Canada. So it's it's a very interesting tool just, again, to play around with and, and see um, what you can get out of it. Um, let's move into a couple of the comments. Cheryl asked, when you use it for translation, how does that work? 
Yeah. So I haven't done this yet. So that's all you, Blaine. <laughs> right, right, right. And uh, honestly, I, I haven't done it myself, but I have been watching others use it for translation and they will generally take um, the, uh, the text-based um, content that is not in the desired language and input it and, and ask, you know, chat GPT to say, please translate this into language X, Y, Z. Um, now, um, the current version of ChatGPT version three requires a um, text-based prompt. So you're gonna have to be able to um, input that as, uh, as text. Um, I think the new version, version four, can use um, images. So you might be able to, for example, take an image and, and say, translate this image into, uh, you know, extract the text and translate it into you know, English or German or whatever the case might be. And so, um, you know, it, it, I wouldn't introduce that translation in court, right? But I think it's a good place to, to start, especially if you're using it to, you know, say, is this relevant to my research or not, or, or whatever the case might be. Great. I'm actually thinking that it might be a good thing to try and do a live demo, but um, because that could be fun. Um, so I'm pulling that up, but can you tell us a little bit more about prompts? Because that's a really important piece of this um, and kind of just give an, a, an idea of what you mean by prompt and, and how to write a good prompt. Sure. So the prompt is essentially the, the question that you, or direction that you're presenting to ChatGPT. So when you open up ChatGPT, there'll be a box and it will ask for a text input and um you know oh there's some good examples of prompts there and so what it, it's you're asking it to do something now in my experience the more detailed the prompt the better the response will be so for example you know rather than tell me about genealogical research in upstate new york right that's a prompt it'll give you something but you know you might want something more um specific than that and so there's a couple things you can do. You can ask it for a broad question like that and then focus in on aspects that it produces. Or if you have a more specific question in mind, you, you can go there, right? Um, provide uh, resources I can use for um, genealogical research in Jefferson County, New York in the 1900s, right? That's a more specific um, question. Now, again, we have to be careful because the more fact-based we want it to be, the more there can be this sort of, uh, you know, making up the answer kind of thing in, in, in that text prediction that it's doing. So we do want to be careful there. But, um, you know, I find that the more specific question, the generally the better the, prompt, the, the answer will be. And what I love is what you were just mentioning is that I can take what it gives me and ask a follow-up question, right? It, it knows that I'm continuing the conversation and saying, oh, okay, regarding start with the basics. What do you mean by that? Or, you know, something like that. I can, I, I can work with what it gives me. Um, and so that that's generally how I will go about doing this. Sometimes I'll ask a prompt and I'll realize that was a terrible prompt for whatever <laughs> reason, right? But the nice thing is, guess what? I just ask a new prompt or revise it and, and ask again. So it's, it's some of it is, is trial by error. Or yeah, so, player. yeah, um, I'm trying. I'm trying to remember um, what county my town is in. Um, so, as we're talking, I'm just going to play around with it and just keep this on the screen and keep this going. Um, and we've already got some people. Yeah, live demo. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. um, so that's good. You can, you can, you can see it. You know, as it is blinking. Right. The longer it takes to respond, the more it's kind of using its system and its knowledge to come up with a response. Blaine, have you noticed that? And, and do you think that that is a clue that we should be honing in on? I feel like the faster it comes up with a response, the more likely that response is to be, oh, no, that's not good. Um, <laughs> to be um, based on its, its model data. If it's thinking for a long time, it almost feels like mm, I should maybe not trust this response as much. I think that's true with one caveat, and I think what we just saw, and that is that it's it's 
really being burdened by um, queries. And so, you know, sometimes it'll just be like, well, I, you know, I, it, there's too much going on right now. I, I can't devote enough resources to give you the answer. But that being said, I do think that, you know, when it takes a long time to think about something, that could be a, a red flag that it's, you know, um, it's having trouble, meaning the prediction of what's next in the string was not as easy as it could have been, which means right. maybe it's really rare. Maybe it's, you know, maybe the predictions aren't very good and, uh, and so on. Yeah. Now, yeah, so um, happily, well, this response is actually correct. So okay. that's good. There you go. <laughs> now, uh, that actually brings us to another point in that, that, that the version of um, chat GPT that most people are using is a free version. Um, yeah. So you have to create an account, but once you do, when and you're granted access, it's a free version. They do have a a pro version, um, which is I think twenty dollars a month, and um, you know I've signed up for that just because I'm kind of exploring the tool and trying to understand. And so um, that twenty dollars a month gives you uh, sort of priority access. So when it's kind of down for other people, you'll be able to still sneak in and use it and. And so on. You also get, um, I think, earlier access to newer versions. There's a, a newer version that's out just recently. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure it's totally worth the cost, but it's, you know, something you can think about. And I think that's great that you raised that, actually, because I believe Roger asked about that earlier. So, yeah, so thanks for that. that. Um, yeah. And Daphne saying, you know, wow, just asked it about Codford, St. Peter and Wiltshire and had a very good response. So that's good. Some some early use um, and and coming in positive. Um, Ursula actually making a recommendation for DeepL for translations, um, also based on AI, saying the quality is better. I would trust Ursula's opinion on that. Um, a, another very good um, is, uh, genealogist, that's what I'm trying to say. That, that was a hard word for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> DNA lady in the UK saying, I think it's a fantastic tool. Um, so that's uh, some good positive reviews, right? Um, yeah, I'm just looking through your guys' comments, but do keep them coming. Um, very interesting discussion. Um, we wanted to highlight, there was a couple of um, mentions of it already, but there is a fan, and I think um, Charlotte already shared the link. Um, there's a fantastic blog being written um, uh, by Steve. Oh, I don't remember Steve's last name. Um, it's in my notes somewhere, but I don't want to mess up my chat GPT demo here. Uh, so um, Steve's been writing and testing the system against things like GEDCOMs and relationship analysis. So um, read through the comments. Charlotte has shared that blog post. Thank you very much, Charlotte. That's great. Um, take a look at that blog. And I think it's Ash Ancestors, but I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. So Steve, I'll apologize if I got that wrong. Um, but I did notice he was actually in the comments as well today. So thanks for being with us, Steve. That's awesome. great. Let me, yeah, let me just add, I love your blog. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that me too. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an exciting tool to use. Um, and I think as Blaine said, it's kind of just getting started. I'm wondering, Blaine, what else um, you have tested it with? Um, what other types of, of information or tests have you experimented with on, on this, on the system? Well, you know, I think one of the things I saw kind of going around the genealogy community um, was the the question, who is so and so, right? And it would be the mm -hmm. the name of a a, a well known um, genealogist, and it would provide an output. And a lot of times, the output was absolutely incorrect, right? <laughs> and so that's again that gets to the point of the of the factual. It's that's facts again, um, and so that's something I think is is not what I would use this for. But, um, you know, as you said, the brainstorming, the background, historical context, um, email drafting, blog post drafting, there's all kinds of things that I think, um, you know, this this tool is is being used for. And, you know, one point I think that we mess, probably haven't emphasized so much is that genealogy in the uh, the past 10 years has been just inundated with AI. Right. Mm -hmm. So things like um, uh, through lines, there's not a human being at Ancestry that's building all of our through lines. Right. Spending all night long every night going, oh, I, I think this is a connection. Right? <laughs> they're they're connected by an algorithm that's been trained to make 
connections. It's AI, just, you know, it, it's an art, it's an automated algorithm. Um, you know, shaky leaf hints is AI. My heritage um, family uh, theories of relativity is AI. These, these are all tools that are providing us with new information that we then take and and verify and reject and so on. So um, I, I don't want to make people think that that AI and genealogy is all of a sudden a, a brand new thing, right? It's it's absolutely not. It's AI has become a fundamental part of genealogy. Um, you know, all of these genealogy companies they couldn't offer the databases that they offer today without algorithms that process the data, right? So, you know, OCR, which is, you know, optical character recognition, right? Recognizing words in an image is an AI um, process. There are uh, all kinds of different things that are that are being utilized. Um, and so this isn't new. It, it isn't, uh, AI isn't new, but this is just one new tool that, that we can add to that. And Although we focused on chat GPT for this particular lecture, this particular talk, just because it's easier, there's so many other um, other tools. And in fact, one thing that we don't, um, that we haven't talked about too much is the the image uh, generators, right? There's, there's all kinds of um, AI image generators where you provide it again with a text-based query and it will produce an image. So for example, I might say something like um, to an AI generator, uh, to an image generator, produce a, um, okay, like you, Jen, I will always start it with please. I don't know why, I just do, <laughs> right? Please yeah. generate a, a Zoom background with the words, the genetic genealogist or something like that, right? And so it, it will create something. Sometimes it will create something really great. Sometimes these images are horrific and haunting, right? And so <laughs> we can just, uh, but refine it from there. It'll give us an image and we can say, oh, no, no, you do this and do that. And, and through rounds of progression, it will create an image. Whereas I'm not much of an artist. So I'm, you know, my, my, my skills are pretty limited. So I, I can use that, that help. Yeah, I think one of the um, best things that I have found with this tool um, and many others actually um, in the world of genealogy is simply the question of what else should I know about this topic? Um, it's I think that's become my favorite prompt with ChatGPT is just asking a question, setting the stage, and then as it generates more text and more information, just saying, what else is there? What, what have I missed? Um, and surprisingly good responses in terms of um, social history. And anybody who watches our sessions regularly knows I'm a huge fan of fan research, friends, associates, and neighbors. I use that all the time. Um, so I'm learning more and more about how to do fan research better um, as a result of um, of the tools that are being generated. Um, Blaine's discussion on other AI tools is also um, prevalent in our work at Find My Past. Obviously, if you use the Find My Past app, you can open your camera through the app and point it at a headstone and it will transcribe the, you know, pull the characters off the rock for you. Um, that That is AI. So it's it's around us all the time. It's We're surrounded with, with it. So I think, um, in my opinion, better to be kind of in the early stages and get to know this technology um, and and take advantage of it so that as it grows and develops, you have a really good solid foundation of how to incorporate it into your research down the road. Um, yeah, you know, so, what, oh, go ahead. one of the things I always worry about is that, you know, we I, I, I always hesitate when people propose having sort of this perfect polish tool that does X, Y, Z, right? Because then there's the tendency to take the output and think, well, this, this output must be great, correct output. Whereas when you're sort of an early adopter like this, you, you are forced to reckon with the fact that, that a lot of this is, is not going to be factually accurate information. And therefore you tend to be more dubious. Whereas who knows, maybe 10 years from now, people will take the output of an, an algorithm like this and be, well, this is, you know, this is this is it. Um, whereas we, I think, those of us that are early adopters will be sort of on the fence about, okay, this is great, but as always, I'm going to take this, research it myself, and verify this information. So, I, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Be being an early adopter is, I think, really, really beneficial. 
there's a lot of common misconceptions and myths around using these tools. And I think we've addressed some of those, but is there anything um, that sticks out in your mind, Blaine, that we haven't touched on yet? Um, that's a really good question. I think we covered most of the major ones that I that I had concerns about. Um, you know, the, the bias, plagiarism, copyright, factual limitations, those are all just, if you always have those in the back of your head, I think that's going to be really helpful. For me, probably the one most people are going to run into is the whole factual issue. And then after that, I think it's going to be the whole plagiarism issue. And I, I, I don't even like the word plagiarism when it comes to this because, um, you know, plagiarism has always referred to, to, to human content. I think we almost need a new word to refer to using AI content, um, uh, especially when it's not uh, cited, right? And so, um, but regardless, you know, that's going to be where this, I think a whole lot of this plays out. How much can we use AI in our work? You know, I feel zero guilt at all about drafting an email using chat GPT and not citing it, right? I don't have an asterisk at the end of my email that says drafted with the help of chat GPT. And guess what? I don't feel bad about that at all. Um, <laughs> So, and if you, know, you guys don't know, Blaine is also a lawyer, so we can, tr we can, I think we can trust his instinct. <laughs> okay, now I need to add the asterisk, not legal advice, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you know, to, how far does that extend, right? If I write a blog post, I'm going to be a little bit iffier about not saying, you know, constructed in part with chat GPT. I, I, I don't know. I, I just feel like I've been, it's been so ingrained in me to, to cite my sources, right? And to avoid the issue of, as an author, that was something that would keep me up at night, right? Did I accidentally copy a paragraph that I didn't even realize I copy and, and didn't cite it or whatever the case might be? And I, I literally lost sleep over that. So, I, you know, it's something that's really important to me. And, and um, you know, that's an issue that's just so completely unresolved right now. Yeah, and, and a new issue, right? So someone just asked about whether or not Elizabeth Schoen Mills had come up with citations yet for this, um, and which is actually a perfect segue. So one of the reasons this discussion actually came about is because Blaine started a new Facebook group um, a month or two ago, um, six weeks ago, something like that. And it's exploded, of course, um, because it's Blaine's and he always gets big Facebook groups. Um, and that's actually kind of how I started digging in and playing with this. Um, and I think over 2000 members now of which Elizabeth Schoen Mills, I believe is one, right? Yeah. Um, and she has commented numerous times um, on the post there and, and is contributing to this discussion. So um, for those of you interested in joining, um, we would invite you to do so. Genealogy and Artificial Intelligence Group is that's the name of the group on Facebook. We're going to share the link in the chat. If it hasn't already been, it may have. Charlotte probably beat me to it. Um, but we would invite you to join the group and join the discussion um, and read some of these comments, read through the posts, understand how the context can be used and the implications of it. Um, there's a lot of various opinions in that group. There's a lot of vocal people in that group, which is actually great, right? Because we're all contributing to this new process and this new learning and this this new phase of discovery with these tools and how to how to best work um, ethically with these tools. Yeah, and it's important to be, you know, it is important to question and doubt, right? As a trained scientist, mm -hmm. I, that's, I, I spent six years in grad school being trained to question everything I, I see and hear and read, right? And so I don't want to give the impression that I think that this is the best thing that's ever been created, right? And that I think every genealogist needs to stop doing basic research and just use chat GPT. Right? I'm not <laughs> even getting close to that. What I'm saying is, here's a new tool, understand benefits and um, cons of using that tool, and maybe add it to your workflow, and maybe don't. Um, but it, I just want to introduce it as an option. But I don't want to give the the idea that I that I'm, you know, th th I think this is the best thing that's ever happened, right? So I, I just yeah, want to make that not clear. quite sliced bread material yeah. yet. Yeah. yeah, we haven't quite hit that level. Yeah, I, you know, it's, you, you're right, though. I think when doing basic genealogy and building out your tree and like going from who is the parent of this ancestor, it, it's not going to be that helpful tool. Um, and I certainly don't turn to it in those types of activities. Um, 
but and as we've said before, right during the hour, when when we kind of lean towards these tools is when we need a little bit of a push. Um, I don't know much about this area, or I'm stuck. I have a brick wall. Now you can't really tell G Chat GPT I have a brick wall. Solve it for me. But you can say I think there might be something in this little piece of my brick wall that I haven't explored yet, and put that in as a prompt and see if it comes up with something that you just simply haven't thought of yet. Um, it's like having a brainstorm session at your kitchen table with all of your best genie friends um, on steroids a little bit, right? Because it it's going beyond kind of your local knowledge and bringing in the knowledge of whatever it was taught. Um, there was a question about where does it get its information? And I'm not sure that I have that information readily available. Blaine, do you know how it was, where the information in the tool actually comes from? Sure. So, um, and it, again, it's, it's, it's important to recognize that it, it's not a, really a database of information, right? It's a word prediction algorithm. So the data it was trained with is it was trained with, um, if I have to pull the top of my head, something like 70 gigabytes of text-based data from the internet. So all this data was, this text was gathered from the internet and it was, tr this algorithm was trained. So you don't want to think of this uh, um, chat GPT as being a uh, an, an interface that's on top of this warehouse of information. It's not, right? All it is is a trained algorithm. And all it's doing is saying, based on my training, I think the is the next word here. I think Jefferson County is the next word here. And that's that's just taking the query and it's training and producing that. It's not going out and saying, Oh, based on this query, it looks like from this database, Jefferson County is the best answer. It, it's just not doing that. So it's kind of like, you know, it's it doesn't have any information, believe it or not. Right. Um, it, it does. It, if we disconnect chat GPT from the Internet, right, it's still able to make the same predictions that it makes because it's not going out and getting information from anywhere clicked on the wrong one. Yeah, so I my my setup is my word choice even in in this discussion is not entirely accurate. So listen to Blaine and not me, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not choosing my words carefully here. Um yeah, so interesting discussion and some good some good questions and some good comments. Um thanks Roger for sharing this 570 gigabytes of text. Um I was only uh, off by half a terabyte. That's not so bad. Yeah, you were good. Yeah, you were fine. Um, <laughs> um Let's um, let's finish. I think maybe we just have a couple questions left. Let's just see if we can finish with a quick a question. So Marianne just posted this. Can I ask it to go to Netherlands version of Wikipedia and translate an article, or do I copy paste or otherwise input the article somewhere into the tool? That's a good question, and I honestly don't know the the answer to that. So but Marie's actually how... got a response. I think um, you can link it to a web page and ask it to use it as your context for your prompt. Um, so it sounds like there's a little bit of playing around that needs to be done, but um, um, maybe in the comments, this conversation will continue past the um, past the uh, discussion here, um, and and we can answer that qu that question collaboratively as a group. Um, I'll admit, Marianne, I haven't tested that either, um, so I'm not sure. But uh, I'm, you know, what I'm going to do as soon as we're done here, uh, <laughs> start messing around with it. Um, yeah, Steve, um, Stephen Little saying, I've heard ChatGPT called spicy autocomplete and autocomplete on steroids. Um, would you agree with that, Blaine? You think those are appropriate analogies? I think those are really good analogies. And in fact, my hope is that um, this will be integrated even more into things like um, Gmail, Outlook, and Word, for example. Because I, I'm sure we've all been noticing more of the autocomplete functions at um uh, for me, it's Word and Gmail that come out the most, and they're not that great. But imagine if you could sit down to your your Gmail and say, I would like, and there's a, a 50 word phrase that's put in front of you. And you're like, yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> right. And so, you know, you just hit tab and the whole thing gets entered. Um, right. And I think that's that's really what chat GPT is. It's it's predicting what the the next word in the string is going to be. And so, you know, the more we can we can do that, the, the better. Yeah, so our, our end point here um, is words, not facts, right? Remember that, please, as you're using the tool, it's important. I'm gonna probably have that in a post-it note on my desk for a while uh, to keep that at 
forefront of my brain as well, as we kind of learn to implement these tools. It's like saying to chat GPT, what comes with peanut butter? And, and of course we all auto autofill in jelly after that. So think of it as your peanut butter and jelly text. That's how I'm going to try and remember it. That's, that's, I don't know why that popped into my brain, but it did. Maybe I'm hungry. All right. Um, thank you very much, Blaine, for being with us today. It's a really interesting discussion. And I think an, an, a good introduction to the new tool. Um, hopefully we can do this again at some point as things develop and as people start to use it, we'd love to hear what you're doing with it as well. So out there in the community, um, you know, let us know um, as you experiment. Um, oh, Roger, Roger. Honey and peanut butter? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That's great. Um, let us know how you're using it and, and how you're experimenting. We'd love to hear your story. Send them across to us. You guys know the drill, discoveries at findmypast.com um, and include tools like ChatGPT in those stories. We'd love to know how you're exploring. I know um, someone very early on mentioned um, a benefit to one place studies and I totally agree. I think um, in terms of house history, one place studies, this tool is gonna be great. So. Um, as you're working with it and, and kind of getting to know the tool, do share with us at Find My Past um, in our Facebook page and, and elsewhere. Join Blaine's Facebook group. Um, we'll give that one last shout out. And I'm going to see if I can squeeze it onto the screen one last time. Um, it, there we go. If you need the title of the Facebook group, Genealogy and Artificial Intelligence, I hope to see all of you there. We'll engage in more discussion as well. Blaine, thank you once again. Uh, really appreciate it. And for anybody who missed this discussion or wants to go back to Blaine's slides, it will be available on the Find My Past Facebook page and the YouTube channel um, very quickly. So with that very much, have a great day, everybody, no matter where you are in the world. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you again soon. Um, we'll be back on Friday for Find My Past Fridays.